I'd like to do is to show you my view of where people came from. And it's very different from where we normally accept. And the only way in which you can try and get a handle on how we evolved to eat is if we go back to people who live closer to the traditional ways. And many years ago, I was able to go to West Africa and to see a little of how people eat there. In more recent years, I've been able to speak to the Indians from Colombia, and you find similar peoples up in the Amazon, living a life that is so much closer to where we used to be. Go out into Southeast Asia, and you find these highly civilized people whose grandparents and great-grandparents were Stone Age people living in the jungle. The rate at which Southeast Asia has mushroomed into the modern era is really quite extraordinary. A number of movies have, in recent years, set out to try and encapsulate the paradox between modern man and our early antecedents. And, of course, the most memorable one must surely be Stanley Kubrick's 2001. symbolism of this sort of frustrated banging away at a skeleton, at a skull, whilst you see the tape here in the background being intercut and falling down. It makes you realize the frustration that a pre-human ape must have had, dreaming of the skill you need to bring down your prey. And it was also very well articulated, I thought, by that great transvestite comic, Eddie Izzard. Five million years ago, and that, I think, is the point where we started to walk erect. Hunting was bizarre. Come on, there's a bison. Come on, lads. <laughs> Will you die, sir? <laughs> die, I tell you. You're in our territory. I peed and pooed all around here. <laughs> Will, ah. Will you die, sir? Could you possibly? I, you could feed a family for nine years. <laughs> This could take hours. <laughs> Bugger it now. Come on, where are you? How can you be late? Bastards. <laughs> oh, that is much better. <laughs> Did you see that? The others come running up. So, I picked up a stone, I hit the bison. He's just, he's gone, he's dead. This is brilliant, Jeff. <laughs> this could be the beginning of an age. Well, that's what I was thinking. I, uh, provisionally, I've entitled it the, the age of big things falling over because they're hit by small things of a much denser material. <laughs> no, just, just Stone Age. Stone Age, yes! And it does pose that essential conundrum. How, when you hadn't evolved into Stone Age humans, how could you do it? And in fact, it is remarkable. If you look at the skeletal remains, it's quite remarkable how far back you can go in history, much further than you'd expect, and find the marks of stone on bones. And I summarized these in a lecture when I first announced this theory of mine two years ago in the United States. And these are the examples I showed them. This, for example, comes from Cheddar Gorge, from Kent's Cavern in Goss Cage, and a team at Oxford University have examined this. This is the end of a uh, human form, it's vulnerable. And it's been radiocarbon dated at 9,000 years old. If we look closely, you can see the marks. They're parallel cuts. This was discovered by William Pengelly in 1866. It's only recently been looked at. But there are parallel cuts which quite clearly show humans cutting meat away from the bones. You can crank it back even further than that. 
a hundred thousand years ago from the Rhone River. Clear parallel cuts on human bones and also the bones of deer found in association in the same cave. This is from Dika in Ethiopia. This is from 3 million, 390,000 years ago. This is from Australopithecus. This is far and away the most ancient sign of cuts made on bone. It does show that people have been cutting meat from bones. Now, I find that particularly interesting. This suggests that they were using stones, not as any is our joke, to bring down their prey, but far sooner our antecedents were using stones, stone tools, to cut the flesh from already dead creatures. But how could that be? You didn't run around and wait until somebody dropped dead of old age and then leap upon it? No. I felt, ladies and gentlemen, that what we were almost certainly doing was uneasily coexisting with wolves. And we were allowing packs of wolves to bring down prey, and then we, or our antecedents, would take meat from victims hunted by the pack of wolves. We were bright enough to do that, but not agile enough to hunt in the first place, as of course the wolves were. And so this was published two years ago as a new theory on human origins. And the key passage just drew attention to what seems to me to be the obvious conundrum, that humans are inequipped to capture the meat that they needed, these early humans. So that was my view. Now, it's, it's a nice theory, and it works very well. But theories are much better if you've got evidence to support them. And of course, at the time of writing the article, I didn't have any practical evidence. Then I had a phone call from a friend who said the BBC had just put out a program which has an example of exactly what you're saying. How do mere humans without fangs or claws who can't outrun a wildebeest get a meal around here? Let the lions kill the wildebeest, then steal their dinner from right under their noses. All the signs point to a fresh kill nearby. This could end badly. They make their move. Self-confidence is everything. Suddenly, the lions back off. What a fantastic example. With lions, not wolves, it is exactly what it is that I postulate. Except the BBC told the story in a slightly different way in their Human Planet program. And you may find the contrast quite amusing. The very first story in the Human Planet's Grassland program is a filming first. These people steal fresh meat from the mouths of hungry lions. This sequence was incredibly difficult to film. Lions hunt at night, but it's too dangerous to approach lions when it's dark. We only had a few days in the field. We knew we were up against it. The whole production team worked day and night to help the Dorobo find a lion pride with a fresh kill they could risk stealing meat from. The three guys psyched themselves up and boldly walked into the lions while they were feeding on the wildebeest. It's basically a huge bluff. The bluff worked. We were all so pleased we had captured and recorded this story for posterity. And the Dorobo were proud we'd been able to film something that is such an important tradition in their lives. Oh, I do like that. No, I'm afraid they weren't following the spur and listening to the telltale signs of the jungle that would give the game away. The BBC production team and their Land Rovers had gone and found the lions and told them where to go so they could film them. Um, it is interesting when you look twice at something how it doesn't always turn out to be the way that on television 
it had first appeared. But nonetheless, there is a great example of exactly the kind of behavior that I had postulated. And just a month ago, I had another one, which came from this BBC program many of you may have seen about the mammoths in Siberia. It is like unwrapping an ancient mummy. Yeah. It yeah. is an ancient mummy. It's an ancient mummy, sure. That fur is really long. Now lying on its back, its head is flopped to one side and its legs stick up in the air. Isn't it hard to believe that this is something which died so long ago? Yeah, I no, mean, it doesn't yeah. look like an animal which has been dead for thousands and yeah. thousands of no, years, no, an no, animal no. from the Ice Age. Yeah. Interestingly enough, the remains of that mummified mammoth showed signs of animal attack, but also signs of parts of the body having been cut away by sharp stones by humans. And a month ago today, Daniel Wright of the United States made contact with the authorities and he said, I believe that these people were actually not hunting mammoths themselves because they weren't able to. He said, I believe what they were doing was scavenging mammoths that had already been hunted by Asiatic lions. It is again, early human society using predatory animals to bring down the food that they themselves then need. The hunter-gatherer only makes sense once humans have evolved to the relatively high level of sophistication that we see in modern humankind. That the hunter-gatherer couldn't have existed until pre-humans had already found a way of getting meat before they were intelligent enough to be hunters and traps. They were actually human opportunists rather than hunter-gatherers. That essential stage links us with the apes. The hunter-gatherer was not the crucial part. It was the human opportunist, the pre-human scavenger. That is where our current development came from. And I'm astonished that nobody ever thought of it before. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed.